Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everybody to the first uh, T&E NPE Foundations Curriculum Lecture Series uh, talk for the new year and happy new year to everyone. Um, just some quick reminders, all of you that are panelists, that, you, that are human dynamics trainees, you do have the ability to um, turn on your video and or your audio um, and ask questions directly to our speaker. Um, so feel free to do that. Those of you uh, that um, are not a, a panelist, um, please put your questions into the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen. Please avoid using the uh, chat box uh, because those are more difficult for us to keep track of um, when you're asking questions. Uh, we will try to get to all of your questions uh, at the end of the talk. Um, but we will give priority to those uh, from the, neonate, the hemo, neonatal hemodynamic fellows um, that are panelists. So um, with that being said, um, there is also, and I will show it again, don't worry, uh, at the end of the talk, but there is a QR code for, um, for our evaluation. So you can grab that QR code now if you would like. Uh, that way you can fill out the evaluation during in, or at the end of the talk, and then I will put this up again uh, once we are done. So let's get started. Um, Professor Arvind Segal is a neonatologist and the head of cardiovascular research at Monash Children's Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. Um, so we have to thank him for getting up super early, I believe, to give this talk to us. Uh, Professor Segal has been using ultrasound since 2003 with formal training in cardiology from University College Hospitals in London. His current research focuses on cardiovascular adaptations in infants with severe bronchopulmonary dysplasia and those with uh, fetal growth restriction. So uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Segal, for, um, for giving us this lecture um, on chronic pulmonary hypertension. And let's go ahead and get started. I will give you the floor. Thank you, Danielle, and good afternoon to, to everybody. It's bright and early morning in Australia. So I'm just going to uh, close my video, uh, but I, I can share my screen. And if somebody can tell me that they can see my slides. We can see them. Thank you. OK, perfect, perfect. No worries. So look, I, um, I think enough has been written and said about bronchopulmonary dysplasia. My uh, take on this is from the left heart uh, perspective. And the reason for that is little attention is paid towards how the left heart and the dynamics originating from the uh, systemic arterial circulation in the left heart contribute to the pulmonary vascular disease. Um, so in this presentation, I'll outline what are the contemporary opinions and what is the evidence behind uh, what I want to say, how this transitions from uh, post-capillary pulmonary hypertension uh, to the combined pre and post-capillary pulmonary hypertension, uh, briefly about the supportive evidence from the animal models, um, what is the role of bedside echocardiography and, and what is the evidence from the cardiac cath data and how it helps uh, in improving diagnostics and therapeutic precision. And in the end, um, how does uh, systemic hypertension, uh, not pulmonary hypertension, but systemic hypertension play a role and how to evaluate that and what are the therapeutic um, relevance uh, in addressing this whole series of pathophysiological changes? So consensus definition, which has been prevalent for severe BPD is need for respiratory support and uh, more than or equal to 30% oxygen. In Australia, New Zealand, neonatal network, we don't have this mild, moderate, severe category, but we define it as lung disease with ongoing need for ventilatory support or oxygen, um, whether it's high flow, CPAP, mechanical ventilation at 36 weeks post-menstrual age. Important to appreciate that it's not a homogeneous disease. Uh, it is heterogeneous. There are there are contributions from the lung parenchyma, there are contributions from the pulmonary arterial circulation. But my focus in the main today is what is the, com uh, the contribution from the pulmonary venous 
perspective. And it's important to understand this pathophysiology because the evaluations and management is diametrically opposite to what we conventionally do using pulmonary vasodilators. So uh, fellows uh, attending people who work in perinatal centers very well know uh, the importance and how common bronchopulmonary dysplasia is. And we also know that routine echo screening in many centers, including ours, for chronic pulmonary hypertension, maybe from 34, 36 weeks onwards, is a standard of care. And a significant proportion of these infants who are born small or who are born uh, very premature can have pulmonary artery hypertension as a uh, complication of PPT. So there are a number of articles which look at uh, the pulmonary artery hypertension aspect um, and how it complicates. A lot of them use subjective echo parameters like right atrial dilatation, right ventricle dilatation, hypertrophy. And we attempted some time back to put some objectivity into it. So the range of echo parameters, I think uh, people are well aware with the pulmonary artery velocity configurations and the eccentricity indices, along with the conventional parameters of the tricuspid regurgitation. But my point is that clinically, uh, how do we suspect uh, that there is a component of left heart disease uh, or component from the systemic arterial circulation coming into play? So clinically, their presentation is no different from the conventional pulmonary artery hypertension. There is increased requirement for respiratory support, labile oxygenation, and features um, you know, of BPD and pulmonary hypertension include there is RV hypertrophy, dysfunction, increased PVR. So contemporary diagnostic and therapeutic options, opinions are focused, uh, how we diagnose, how we manage, we focus on the right heart aspects. And our therapy, like sildenafil, like nitric oxide, these are all aimed at reducing PVR and increasing blood flow to the lungs. Um, and that, that's the majority of the patients who present like that. But if you look at the other uh, aspect of it, in the Panama classification, there is a component of pulmonary hypertension which is dedicated to the pathophysiology arising from LV diastolic dysfunction. So that's an important component. And similarly, in the European Society of Cardiology guidelines, um, there is a category which looks at contributions from LV systolic and diastolic dysfunction. So essentially, this is a paradigm shift uh, where we focus on the relationship or contribution arising from the LV cardiac disease or systemic arterial changes towards pathogenesis, towards diagnosis, and ultimately, I would show you information um, how it affects the, the treatment regimen as well. Now, we look at scientific plausibility. What is the link or what is the sequential contribution? So chronic systemic arterial stiffness, which is seen in infants with BPD, that may generate enough afterload to induce LV hypertrophy or LV dysfunction. That leads to increased transmission of pressure across the mitral valve, so increased diastolic left atrial pressure and that can lead to pulmonary venous hypertension and cause pulmonary edema. So this sequential contribution is termed as post-capillary pathophysiology, and over time, it will transition into a combination of post- and pre-capillary pathophysiology. So in this subset of infants, uh, the problem is not blood getting into the lungs so much. The problem is mainly the blood's not able to get out of the lungs because of systemic artery stiffness or LV dysfunction. So in these infants, the current therapeutic strategies like pulmonary vasodilators, nitric oxide, sildenafil, which are designed to reduce PVR, increase blood flow to the lungs, they may be counterproductive. So, you know, there is a subset of infants with severe BPD, and you, and you start nitric oxide, they deteriorate. Possibly, this is the pathophysiology in play there. So we, we, we worked on it. We published in 2016, and this is the cartoon you will see uh, repeatedly during the presentation. You can see here 
we feel the in this particular subgroup the pathology is arising either from the systemic aorta where there is increased thickness and stiffness and that is passing on the effect to the lv where is, there is reduced contractility and that passes on and the the pressure to the left atria and that causes pulmonary venous congestion so also are listed various echo parameters which we have used and others have used to delineate the the pathology like the chai index the reduction in mean velocity of circumferential fiber shortening and decreased uh, pulmonary venous vtis increased ivrt and and systolic wall stress in transmitral ea ratios put it another way what i'm talking about is what you see in the right lower quadrant where you can see the lv is hypertrophied is dilated to some extent the septum is shifted to the right which is very different from right upper quadrant of conventional pulmonary hypertension where the rv is dilated and the septum is shifted to into the left side so in the right lower quadrant you can see the pressure is transmitted into the la and if the pfo is open it can go into the ra but if pfo is not open or in addition to that it can be transmitted into the pulmonary venous circulation now from the adult literature how common is lv disease with regard to pulmonary hypertension so in adults um this can be seen in more than 60% patients who have lv systolic dysfunction and more than 80% in patients with lv diastolic dysfunction so there is in the adult literature people are looking at it have been looking at it for quite some time in terms of delineating the pathophysiology um whether it's functional disease or it is structural disease so could be systemic hypertension or structural disease like coarctation of aorta both can generate enough back pressure leading to pulmonary hypertension so what is important to appreciate is that sick lv dysfunction or aortic disease or aortic valve organic disease or mitral valve organic disease or pulmonary venous occlusive disease in the neonatal circulation we talk about pulmonary vein stenosis which can develop over time all of them can generate the same pathophysiology by causing back pressure changes transudation of fluid across the pulmonary capillary beds and that becomes an edemogenic force so post capillary pathophysiology whether organic or functional becomes an edemogenic factor by transudation of fluid across the pulmonary bed, capillary beds leading to increase need for respiratory support so as i said earlier the problem is not so much blood getting into the lungs the problem is blood not able to get out of the lungs and in such instances standard pulmonary vasodilator therapy runs the risk of acute pulmonary edema sudden respiratory compromise in these subgroup of patients and if you look at adult literature adults with mitral valve disease who might have this problem have been excluded from trials when they are evaluating newer pulmonary vasodilator therapies because they know that by reducing the pvr they can flood the lungs with blood and blood's not able to get out because of the mitral valve disease so it's important to appreciate that before you give pulmonary vasodilators in infants with established chronic lung disease important to make an assessment a thorough assessment of the left sided circulation as well what is the evidence of this from the animal models so they provide useful information about pathophysiology how the disease progresses and how this becomes an important therapeutic target so in the developing porcine model they use non restrictive pulmonary vein banding and over time as the as the model grows this becomes progressively restrictive as the animal matures and that leads to back pressure changes in the developing pulmonary circulation so we all know the effects of chronic hypoxia on the pulmonary circulation by direct effects by increasing pvr decrease vascular compliance but it's important to appreciate that chronic hypoxia in the rat model has also been shown to affect the left ventricle and again 
that leads to uh, impairment of LV function and a back pressure influence on LA dynamics. So not to underestimate the effect of chronic hypoxia that it affects only the right side circulation. It can very importantly affect the left side circulation as well. Now this high pressure venous, uh, high, high venous pulmonary pressure changes, uh, as I mentioned, they uh, contribute to the additional post capillary component of BPD pulmonary hypertension. And ultimately, if it's not identified in time, if it's not treated appropriately, this post capillary or passive pulmonary hypertension over time will become a combination of pre and post capillary pulmonary hypertension or also known as the active pulmonary hypertension as the disease progresses. And that's when it becomes very difficult to manage. We talk about um, right ventricle in isolation. We talk about left ventricle in isolation. But in truth, there is an important LV-RV crosstalk happening. So the role of LV dysfunction and how the, the two ventricles interact is very important to understand. If you look at how the myocardial fibers are arranged, in the epicardium, they are more circumferentially oriented, while in the mid wall, they are more radially oriented, while when you look at the, the endocardium, they are more longitudinally oriented. And many of these fibers are from the right side are very contiguous with either LV epicardial fibers or with the septal myofibers. So it's in a sense quite artificial if you start talking about LV separately and RV separately important that RV effects can also affect the LV by causing the displacement of the septum into the LV, limiting LV inflow, further exacerbating pressure which is going towards the LA. So interventricular septal configuration and motion is very important. As I mentioned in one of the cartoons earlier, if it's the LV disease indominantly, then you might see LV dilated septum being pushed into the right ventricle. If it's dominantly RV disease, the septum is pushed into the LV, but that itself can also affect LV function by limiting the LV inflow. And one uh, useful echo parameters to uh, evaluate the magnitude of this LV-RV interactions is the position of the septum using the LV eccentricity index. Now, what are the regulatory pathways? And the reason why I put a couple of slides here because that directly segues into therapeutics. So we need to understand at the molecular level, at the biochemical level, neurohormonal level, what are the um, mediators which are mediating this particular change? So a healthy endothelium uh, is very important. It, develops a balance between vasodilators and vasoconstrictors. But this balance gets disturbed when there is pulmonary hypertension originating from the LV dysfunction. So there are more constrictors and less vasodilators in the mix. In addition to that, chronic hypoxia in the newborn can cause vascular remodeling. I'll talk about that in a minute and also cause endothelial dysfunction. In addition, there are altered function and expression of calcium channel blockers. So again, the pendulum is tilting more towards vasoconstriction away from vasodilatation. But most importantly, the, the angiotensin system, the renin uh, aldosterone angiotensin system is key in this. So we all know about the angiotensin converting enzyme, but ACE2, is very important here in, in our discussion. It's a counter-regulatory enzyme. So if you understand chronic hypoxia, ACE is upregulated, so there's more angiotensin II being produced, while ACE2 is down-regulated. So this tips the balance towards pro-inflammation, pro-fibrotic, pro-vasoconstriction, pro-vascular remodeling effect. So the dilatory component is subdued so this imbalance is very important and it's of therapeutic relevance and we, we would address that soon. So this table summarizes um, and we published in 2020 different mechanisms including nitric oxide, endothelin, the angiotensin system and, and calcium channels which can be 
uh, involved and can be addressed from the therapeutic point of view. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the, the problem is not so much in this particular subset of cases, not so much blood getting into the lungs, but we're talking about blood getting out of the lungs. And the pathology might start from the systemic circulation like the aorta, or might start from the LV itself by LV functional disease or in combination. So where is the um, evidence from the neonatal studies? We talked about what is available from the adult cardiology area where LV systolic dysfunction and LV diastolic dysfunction both are quite important uh, pathophysiological considerations in terms of diagnostics and choice of therapeutics. So this is our work from 2016 or so. This was a prospective study we, we did in 20 preterm infants with severe BPD compared with preterm infants with no BPD. Uh, assessments were made at 36 weeks and compared with um, healthy term infants uh, between two and five days of age. And what we uh, were looking for in the main is what is happening on the left side. So measurements were compared between the groups and the data was um, adjusted for gestation age and birth weight. So these are the range of echo parameters. Many of you would be would be familiar with, with these echo parameters. Look at pulmonary hemodynamic characteristics, septal configurations, and diastolic dysfunction parameters. And this is this is the information. So you see the BPD group is in the first column, then the preterm, but no BPD group, and then term infants, unadjusted data, gestation age adjusted group effect, birth weight adjusted group effect, and in and at the end, gestation age and birth weight combined adjusters. And you look at this information from the diastolic function parameters and systolic function parameters, especially the mean velocity of circumferential fiber shortening and the transmitral IVRT and E ratios. These this group of BPD infants are very, very, they stand apart in terms of LV disease. So how do you clinically suspect? And if I say like, uh, if I have to give you a very limited view in terms of what are the echo parameters you should be looking at in picking this up from echocardiography perspective, then this would be a child with unremitting clinical course. You have given diuretics, there's no response. You have given pulmonary vasodilators like nitric oxide or sildenafil either there is no response or there is a deterioration. That is when you start suspecting either there is LV functional disease or raises suspicion of pulmonary venous stenosis. And in these infants, um, of course, you look at other parameters, but you look at the LV myocardial performance index, mitral E ratios and tissue Doppler E and E prime ratios. These are sensitive indicators. And of course, many of them overlap with what you see in pulmonary vein stenosis, but the difference really would be that in LV functional disease or arising from the aorta, the end diastolic LA pressure and the interatrial shunting are key differences. Otherwise, the presentation can be very similar. So this is what you would look at. And when you look at the four chamber view, the first clue of this pathophysiology, if you pick it up at the right time, is not RV dilatation, it's the LV dilatation. I'll present a case at the end which summarizes all these parameters. But what is the role of cardiocatheterization? So I work at a tertiary center. We don't have pediatric cardiocatheterization. If we have to access that, the child has to be intubated, transferred out into a different center, which is about 20 odd kilometers away. Uh, but I appreciate many centers in the US might have easy access to that. But in the main, echocardiography remains the initial modality of choice. Certainly catheterization adds value and does influence management and outcomes. So um, this particular study looked at the response of nitric oxide or 100% oxygen to these babies. So these babies were intubated transfer to the cath lab, 
and challenged by nitric oxide or oxygen. This was done in 13 ex preterm infants, now 36 to 40 weeks corrected. And in a subset of these infants, you can see here seven infants. When you give pulmonary vasodilators, you expect a drop in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. But in about half of them, there was an increase in wedge pressure, which might give you some indication that in, in these infants, the problem is either in the lung compliance or the left heart compliance or diastolic dysfunction is playing a part. As I mentioned earlier, uh, a subset of chronic lung disease or BPD patients, when you give them pulmonary vasodilators, they do not improve or they deteriorate. So this could be one example of that. So long-term administration of pulmonary vasodilators like nitric oxide sildenafil physiologically is not particularly fitting in when you have significant post-capillary pathophysiology in play, might cause clinical deterioration and important that before we set them on this path, we must make comprehensive assessments. So how does it affect my practice? So as I said, we don't have easy access to cardiac catheterization. So we, uh, I think this is maybe 2021 or so, we did, uh, similar pulmonary circulation reactivity testing with nitric oxide and oxygen with echocardiography monitoring. So these, these infants were less than 28 weeks at birth. We made assessments at 36 weeks or, or beyond. And before and after intervention, we used standard echo parameters. I think everybody is aware of these parameters. We looked at not only the right side, we also looked at what's happening to the left side circulation. And what we were looking for percentage change in these parameters comparing pre and post intervention. So we did a baseline ventilatory uh, data collection and echocardiography. And then we increased the oxygen from whatever the baseline was 30 or 40% to 100% for 30 minutes, repeated the echo, uh, collected ventilatory data, and then gradually brought the ventilatory settings to the baseline. So now we have a pre and post. And after a gap of three hours in the afternoon, we again collect the baseline data, give nitric oxide 20 parts a million and repeat the echo data. So now we have comparison of pre-intervention versus 100% oxygen and pre-intervention versus 20 parts a million nitric oxide in ex preterm infants currently 36 weeks or more with severe BPD. So what we are looking for is non-reactive component of the pulmonary circulation. And when we have a non-reactive component of pulmonary circulation in response to two strong pulmonary vasodilators, that might suggest left heart dominant physiology and those are the infants in whom we would not give long-term sildenafil. So it helps us rationalize treatment decisions. If I move on to uh, hypertension, so you know there is quite a limited data um, on hypertension and how that is associated with any respiratory sequelae. Uh, but generally, people have seen that chronic lung disease babies run higher blood pressure compared to non-chronic lung disease group. Um, the problem in pre-existing data is the definition of chronic lung disease, which has been used in studies, is quite heterogeneous. People use different cutoffs, how high the blood pressure should be, and when should, should it be assessed to say, okay, how high is too high, and, and the timelines around that. So this is work from Steve Abman's group in the mid-80s. At that time, chronic lung disease was defined as need for positive pressure ventilation in the first week of life, clinical respiratory distress, oxygen dependency at 28 days of age, and radiographic evidence of chronic lung disease. And in that study, the hypertension was defined as systolic BP more than 133 on at least three separate occasions. Now, today you see this cutoff, you think that's too high, the bar is set too high. In this retrospective study, 43 uh, percent of infants were uh, designated as having hypertension. 
Uh, but importantly, the mean age of onset was ranging from 15 days to 15 months, and more than half were diagnosed after NICU discharge. So if you don't follow these infants prospectively after discharge, then you will miss out on a substantial cohort, which is hypertensive. Nonetheless, only the six infants uh, out of these 13 who were found to be hypertensive were treated with, with any hypertensive medications. Then you look at this another retrospective study where 87 infants with chronic lung disease, same criteria for chronic lung disease and hypertension. Mean age of onset was six months and two of these infants were treated. And then another retrospective study um, which in which the BP was uh, picked up from the archived records on day seven, day 28, day 42, and the rhyme, around the time of discharge. So if you were having a mean arterial BP more than or equal to 105 on day nine, then you would miss, you won't make it to this, this database. So the evaluations were, were set on particular dates and the cutoff for mean BP for that particular study was more than 105 millimeter mercury. So five out of 41 infants had hypertension by that criteria and only one was treated. So there are there is this useful information, but there are you know limitations to the data which is available. So this is our study from uh, I think 2021 or so. We looked at 57 infants with severe BPD compared double the number of infants with no BPD, and for cutoffs we looked at the 2017 American Academy Clinical Practice Guidelines to look at centiles based on postmenstrual age. So we did measurements from 36 weeks to 36.6. So that one week immediately after when the chronic lung disease diagnosis is made, we looked at number of infants having blood pressure more than or equal to 90 percentile uh, in, in infants with chronic lung disease. So if you look at systolic BP and mean BP, uh, I'll show you the cutoffs, but the cartoon on the right, you can see here, in the infants with severe BPD, the average systolic BP morning blood pressure over seven days, daily measurements were significantly higher compared to the uh, non-BPD cohort. And similar was the average of the mean blood pressures over the seven days from 36 to 36.6 compared to infants with, with no chronic lung disease. Now, what is important is that we take a step into the why this is um, why these infants have uh, systemic hypertension. So we looked at that aspect as well, looking at comparing preterm infants with BPD uh, with preterm infants with no BPD. And as you can see here, group one is infants with severe BPD comparing with preterm no BPD, and then comparing with term infants, unadjusted data, gestation age, birth weight, and at the end, gestation age and birth weight combined adjusted data. And we were looking at arterial dynamic indices. And you can see here, uh, the arteries are significantly thicker in preterm infants with BPD. And they also have impaired dynamic properties like stiffness index and um, impedance and pulsatility. So thickened abdominal iota uh, is seen in preterm BPD infants. And there are different mechanisms why uh, these might happen, including chronic inflammation, reactive oxygen species, collagen deposition. But the point I'm trying to make is this thickness and stiffness of the systemic arteries, the iota, can generate enough back pressure changes into the left ventricle and become, at the end of the day, LV functional disease causing back pressure into the LA and finally into the pulmonary veins. So left-sided cardiac and vascular changes may be relevant to the pathogenesis and possible treatment of BPD. So let's come to the treatment options here. So there's some work from uh, uh, Peter Murani's group uh, in 2008, some work uh, we did in 2016, 2018, and of course there is some work from um, Amy, Reagan, Daniels, Peter, uh, Patrick, so um, and Adrian's group in Iowa. So I'll, I'll briefly um, end my talk with, with summarizing this. So this is a case 
a report of two infants with severe BPD in whom LV diastolic dysfunction was thought to be contributing to clinical problems. They had subtle findings on echocardiography, but on cardiac catheterization that was confirmed. And they had been tried on diuretics with no improvement and both experienced significant clinical as well as hemodynamic impairment with ACE inhibitors uh, um, in, in that case series with enalapril. This is our work from 2018, 2019. We had consecutive infants who were having severe BPD, unresponsive to standard therapy, and had systemic hypertension. And the question was the use of ACE inhibitors, um, how that would work. So you can see here, these are all extremely preterm infants. All had been tried on sildenafil, had been given diuretics and steroid therapy. And when we got into the mix with ACE inhibitors, they were corrected gestation, or gestation age of at least 41 weeks. And many of them were 45, 51, 58 weeks. Repeat assessments from clinical and echo perspective were made at the end of five weeks of captopril. As you can see here, I've made um, uh, paired assessments. All these infants in this particular subgroup improved markedly from respiratory support requirement and oxygen requirement. Some came from nasal IMB to, to CPAP, some came on from CPAP to low flow and were able to be discharged home. So all the infants had been on diuretics, sildenafil, no clinical improvement, addition of captopril for the management of systemic hypertension led to improvement in oxygen requirement, CO2, gas exchange, dropping the blood pressure. But from the echocardiography perspective, what we found was over five weeks, decreased thickness and improved pulsatility of the iota. On the cardiac side, improved contractility, relaxation, less pressure in the left atria, forward flow in the pulmonary veins has improved. And also, as a sequential effect, the right-sided cardiac output in PVR is also lower. So this is our recent case. Uh, many of you would be able to relate to these presentation. 27 weeks at birth, no antenatal steroids, growth restricted 500 grams, intubated at birth, given paracetamol, ductus closed, tried unsuccessful extubations few times, is now 35 weeks, is on CPAP, 60% oxygen with very labile oxygenation, and systemic systolic blood pressure over the next week is consistently more than 95th centile. So the neonatologist's query is, do we have pulmonary hypertension? Should we start nitric oxide in this baby? So an echocardiogram is done, and you can see here, short axis view, there is some flattening of the septum um, and the mitral valve opens okay. Then we look at here, the question is, is there any tricuspid regurgitation to say there is significant pulmonary hypertension? You do see some TR, but it measured around 1.5, 1.8 meters per second. So not significant really. The duct is closed. So we can't look at any ductal shunting uh, to see any bidirectional PDA. We also look at the, um, the pulmonary artery configuration and the time to peak velocity and, and those ratios. So they are also within with the normal limits, not significant pulmonary hypertension is noticed. But when you go to the four chamber view, that's when I was mentioning earlier, you see there's not much RV dilatation, but the LV is the one which is, which is dilated. So, in simple terms, that should give you the first clue that there is something amiss in, in such patients. We do other measurements. We look at transmitral Doppler. You can see its reversal of ratio is ENA. The IVIRT is increased. And you look at the pulmonary veins. So the Doppler flow signal is very compromised in terms of flow into the left atria. We also look at the vascular Components of these, you can see here, this is the um, vertebral column here, the iota pulsatile at the back, quite thickened iota at the dorsal margin. And when we look at the measurements, um, when we measure on echo pack, this comes to around 950 micrometer. The normal for this, this population is around 650, so significantly thicker and stiffer iota. So this infant is given captopril 
for the management of syst systemic hypertension. I've just circled the VTIs in in these inferences. This is the change in LV output we see. We look at the RV output, you can see how that has improved over a period of time of four weeks. And most importantly, the pulmonary venous flow, you can see how impaired and, and dampened it was, and that's normal pattern in increased flow in the pulmonary venous circulation. And similar information, as I mentioned, is there from Patrick McNamara's group as well, uh, neonatal hypertension in infants with BPD. And these infants were administered in Alipril, and they were on non-invasive respiratory support, about 40% oxygen. So blood pressure improved within two weeks and, and the LV diastolic function indices like the, the IVRT, they improved as well. Importantly, four infants had been previously treated with amlodipine. They still had LV diastolic dysfunction despite improvement in BP, suggesting that ACE inhibitors have something extra uh, more than reducing the BP. Which, which can be useful. So why ACE inhibitors? So ACE inhibitors are the um, masters. Uh, they have multiple pathophysiological linkages causing increased release of norepinephrine, uh, decreased nitric oxide production, increased free radical formations. So they are really at the center and they tend to, ACE inhibitors tend to reset the balance between, as I mentioned earlier, vasoconstrictors, proliferators, versus vasodilators and anti-proliferators in the vascular wall. In addition, they have an important role to play in improving endothelial dysfunction, which is a very important component of problems here. Um, if you compare, so this is adult data comparing ACE inhibitors with diuretics, beta blockers, calcium channel, uh, calcium antagonists, they're all equally effective in reducing BP, but only the ACE inhibitors, the ones which improve endothelial function, and also vascular remodeling. So endothelial dysfunction and vascular remodeling are two important uh, areas where they have a much um, uh, superior role compared to uh, simple blood pressure medications. So take-home message, assessment of LV dysfunction is important uh, in infants with severe BPD, especially when you see features of uh, radiological features of pulmonary edema despite diuretic, diuretic therapy or when you've given them pulmonary vasodilators and their pulmonary edema worsens or respiratory support requirements increase in response to that. Ideally, you would not want that to happen. You would want to make assessments before, uh, before exposing them to such medications. So it's important that physiology drives the treatment. Systemic hypertension is underappreciated. We, when we do the ward rounds, we need to look at the numbers and, and make sense of it. And it's biologically plausible that if you treat early, then uh, you might actually affect or improve cardiovascular health in, in childhood and, and much beyond. So that is where I will end, but I have uh, maybe a one or two minute video to show if there is time. And, and that was really our first case where we used captopillin. Uh, tell me if you can see the video in here. Not seeing the video. Or hearing it. How about now? We can see it, but not hear it. You might have to click the share audio um, on your share screen tab. Yeah, I know there's a way of doing it, but I... Um, I would say just stop stop screen sharing and then restart. And at the very bottom, when you restart screen sharing, click share audio. Has Can you hear it now? Survived, thanks to an Australian first yes. intervention. The tiny girl Thank you. wasn't expected to live. 
but doctors at Monash Children's Hospital have told Emily Rice they're surprised and elated by her recovery. When little Shifra was born at just 23 weeks, she was so pitifully small and sick her parents, Michelle and Neville, were told her chance of survival was slim. I had so many doctors coming in to tell me their outcomes would be very, very poor. She'd be blind, she'd be deaf. Delivered in August last year, she was suffering chronic lung disease and her fragile body weighed a mere 513 grams. She could fit in into my ring. But we kept praying i kept praying medical staff rarely resuscitate babies born so early but experts at the monash children's hospital neonatal intensive care unit took a chance a lot of us actually had given up hope and but the family stayed strong and uh, we thought we'd try her doctor tried an australian first treatment he gave the struggling infant a drug normally prescribed for high blood pressure to hopefully help her lung function. But I told them, let's go for it. Let's give her everything, everything, whatever we can. We decided to give this a go and fortunately it worked for her. She improved, getting bigger and better by the day. And last month was well enough to celebrate her first birthday in the ward. Happy birthday to you. Shifra has grown from around half a kilo when she was born to now almost eight kilograms in weight. Now, after spending her first year of life in hospital, this bouncing baby has headed home. Now she can talk to me. She tells me off. She, <laughs> she makes sounds. She coos. Dada. Dada. While still needing breathing support, developmentally, she's healthy. And her parents, both nurses in Melbourne, say hospital staff have inspired them to always hold on to hope. It's amazing. It's really amazing. It's an amazing team and they don't give up. No rice, no news. So that, that was our, our first case. And the message is that physiology is, is always true. And if you look deeper, thoroughly, you can make a difference. And, and these simple stories are very satisfying for us. Thank you.